If I could ask members of the public in the public gallery who are remaining there to also be quiet as we resume business. And the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 10435 in the name of John Swinney on welcoming the impact of climate cafes. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Mr Swinney to open the debate around seven minutes. Mr Swinney. Uh, President officer, this is the first members debate that I have led in nearly 17 years. And it's not because I've been twiddling my thumbs for some time, but other uh, obligations have prevented me from doing so. But I'm delighted that its topic today is a celebration of an initiative that has emerged from one of the wonderful communities I've had the privilege of representing for over a quarter of a century, Dunkeld and Burnham, and an initiative that is now spreading across the globe. The Climate Cafe movement was started in Dunkeld and Burnham in 2015, and, like many great things in Scotland, is anchored in the sharing of tea, coffee and cake. Local residents were involved in action to tackle climate change, but increasingly felt there was more that had to be done. There was a deep concern, which I suspect is now shared even more by people in Scotland today, that individuals felt dwarfed by the scale of the climate crisis and sought a way to work together to make a greater impact on the issue. Many people have been involved in Dunkeld and Burnham to establish the Climate Cafe, a venture that involves people meeting together to plan local action and initiatives. But the leadership to bring it all together was provided by a local community activist, Jess Pepper, Jess has a formidable record in climate action, making a significant contribution to formulating Scotland's approach to climate, tackling climate change and collaborating with the Climate Reality Project, founded by the former US Vice President Al Gore. Her late father, Simon Pepper, was the founding director of WWF Scotland, a pioneer of climate action, and he would be so proud of the pioneering activity that Jess and her family are contributing to this most important of topics. The Climate Cafe concept has spread throughout Persia, with gatherings now held regularly in Blairgowrie and Rattray, Pitlochry, Aberfeldy, Kettens, Creef, and in Perth. One of the greatest joys about this development has been the involvement of so many young people in this work, marked by the establishment of a Climate Cafe recently in Bredalban Academy, an encouraging signal of the commitment of our youngest citizens. The concept has spread beyond our county boundaries to other parts of Scotland, including Dundee, Kinrosha, Govan, Laird, Kelvin, North Berwick and Aberdeen. During COP26, climate cafes took place virtually involving people in Benin, Alaska, India and Mexico. The concept is now spreading widely across the globe, with inquiries coming in thick and fast to the hub in Burnham about establishing climate cafes from the United States to Australia to Finland. Positive initiatives to deliver climate action have been taken as a result of this community dialogue. For example, the Dunkeld and Burnham community collaborated with Scottish Water to encourage local residents to reduce water consumption. This involved thousands being given, households being given advice on, and information about simple measures to reduce water use. The outcome was formidable. The small community of Dunkeld and Burnham reduced its water consumption by one million litres. The Climate Cafe has now spawned a food share initiative locally that involves food being collected from local stores at the end of the day and with the support of a substantially expanded list of volunteers, the surplus food has been made available to local residents. This initiative provides assistance to individuals at a time of huge pressure on household incomes, but also avoids the unnecessary disposal of perfectly good food and reduces the contribution to landfill as a result. There is now a repair cafe, perhaps modelled on the much lauded TV programme, that provides a space for the restoration and the repair of items that would previously have been replaced with newer versions. The saving of resource and energy is beneficial. Promotion of the work of the cafe is important and there is no greater symbol of this than the local taxi in Dunkeld and Burnham, run by the formidable Marion Wallace. Known as a lady taxi driver, Marion drives visitors from the station to the hotels and venues in the village in an electric taxi emblazoned with the branding Dunkeld and Burnham, home of the Climate Cafe. 
There is just enough time, I'm told, on the journey from the station to the village for visitors to hear an explanation from Marion of the importance of climate action and the steps being taken locally to put this into effect. The work of the Climate Cafe in Blairgowrie and Rattray has led to the creation of the HEAT project, which is now an established organisation that has delivered direct energy saving advice to over 700 households in northeastern and highland Perthshire, helping achieve significant savings in energy bills. It is a regular source of free advice for communities across the local area. The thinking behind the Climate Cafe is to create a space where people of shared interest and common purpose can come together to make community, regional and global connections and to create the political space where this action can be emphatic. And I suppose that last component is critical at this moment in time. The political environment in which we are all living just now is so highly charged and intensely contested. Today, I want to avoid getting bogged down in why we find ourselves where we do. What I want to do is to make an appeal for us to find the space to have the essential conversations we must have to deliver the long-term societal change that is necessary to deliver net zero. Without that realistic, urgent discussion and the necessary action that must follow, we run a very high, if not inevitable, risk of failing in the mission to achieve net zero. And if we fail in that endeavour, we will have made the sustainability of our planet and the sustainability of our communities very, very precarious. We must find places where people can be drawn together, barriers broken down, and take collective action. We cannot allow ourselves to be dwarfed by the enormity of the challenge. We cannot think it is the responsibility of somebody else to act we have all got to be involved. And this is the great strength of the Climate Cafe initiative. It serves as a welcoming forum for all, irrespective of their initial stance or knowledge on climate issues. By cultivating a spirit of unity and building bridges within our communities, it shatters that paralyzing belief that if we cannot do everything, we should do nothing. Instead, it champions the idea that every single step counts and that every individual's action can accumulate into a powerful collective response to the environmental challenges we face. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, one of the many thought-provoking projects taken forward by the Dunkeld and Burnham Climate Cafe was to enlist the community in the creation of bunting to be displayed at COP21 in Paris. Local residents were invited to create images on the theme of love of the planet, one that caught my eye was an oak tree accompanied by the message for the love of Burnham Oak, a reference to the oak tree celebrated in Burnham Wood in Shakespeare's Macbeth. I think we are entitled to conclude today that the Climate Cafe, started in Dunkeld in Burnham, is a profound example of that old saying, from tiny acorns, mighty oaks will grow. Thank you, Mr Swinney. For what it's worth, I think you coped admirably with your first member's uh, business debate in 17 years. Um, we now move to the open debate. Uh, I call first uh, Graham Simpson to be followed by Alec Rowley. Around four minutes, Mr Simpson. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by uh, congratulating uh, John Swinney for securing his uh, first member's debate in uh, a very long time indeed. Um, and can I also thank him for um, educating me today because I came into this debate uh, not really knowing what a climate cafe was, assuming it was an actual cafe, uh, and of course it's not. Um, it is, in fact, um, a what, what it can be is a series of local projects or forums, as, as Mr. Swinney said, um, which, which address environmental concerns, I think. And I see uh, a number of, uh, I assume, people who are involved uh, in, the, in the movement uh, behind me. So having come into the debate not knowing very much, um, I have to thank the Climate Cafe for sending a briefing to us and outlining a number of the really good projects uh, that are around. And the one that struck me 
uh, was the one, that, uh, one of the ones mentioned by Mr. Swinney was that heat project uh, in Blairgarry and Rattray, which is giving uh, direct energy saving advice to over 700 households in, in Perthshire. That seems to me to be a, a really good example of how the Climate Cafe uh, movement can, can work. Um, so I accept it's, uh, it, you know, it started in Persia, uh, but it has expanded. Um, it's gone beyond that. We've had climate cafes, COP26 uh, in Glasgow. Um, we've uh, got one in Ab Aberdeen, uh, but it's gone beyond that. Um, there's one I see in the briefing I had uh, in Oregon um, and uh, elsewhere in the world. So having started off as a bit of a skeptic, and thinking this uh, seemed to be a, a rather vague and woolly idea, I find myself uh, warming to it. And uh, if, uh, if the Climate Cafe movement want to get in touch uh, with me and would like to do something in Lanarkshire, I would be very glad to hear from them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call uh, Alec Rowley to be followed by Audrey Nicholl around four minutes. Mr Rowley. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I would, I would begin by thanking John Swinney for bringing this member's debate here today. It's interesting that as politics become increasingly divided, indeed this Parliament becomes increasingly divided, I do find that these members' debates is where you can have more rational discussion around what are serious, serious issues. And I had the pleasure this morning of meeting uh, with Jess Pepper and, and with, with all the volunteers that are here today. So I, I did learn a lot more around the thinking and the kind of engagement and involvement and, and, and a dear old friend I met as well. Um, but also, also the school pupils uh, for Birda Ban Academy in Aberfeldy and the Dunkeld uh, Primary School. Um, and that, 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 that really, that age range and, and, and involvement in, in the community is, is, I think, the right way to go forward. But I think on that point about, about division, and we've seen it, we've seen it even over these last, these last weeks, that, that the issue, I never believed that climate would become a dividing issue amongst political parties, but sadly it is. And, and I often think it's not you know, it's not about my generation, but I have children, I have grandchildren, and it is about their future. And how do you tackle that? And, and the more I was listening to, to, to what was being said, it reminded me when I was a, a councillor in Fife, and I was quite proud because Fife Council got, at that point, the, uh, the, the, they were the best in the country for recycling. And I actually put that down to the work that had been done in the schools, because the schools had, had driven that agenda and, and done a whole load of work about why it was important to recycle, why it was important to have a, a, a clean environment, etc. And, and I was convinced that they were going home and saying to their parents, so we can recycle, we can do things differently. Um, so a bottom-up approach, I think, and eventually you know, if, 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 if the successes to date were to continue at some point, you could turf all these politicians out and put people in that will put the issue first rather than party politics or their, their personal political careers first. So, as I say, I'm delighted to actually um, be, be speaking in this. Um, the idea that climate cafes are community-led uh, and, and that local people are able, as, as Mr Swinney says, have a, a cup of tea, a biscuit and a chat, then, then we will be more successful in building a movement to demand climate change. You know, people, people sometimes will say to me, well, look at China, look at India, how on earth are we in Scotland going to make a difference? And my first point will often be, well, it's, it's about leadership. It is about leadership and providing that leadership. And these countries, which are much bigger than ours and have a massive population, China over a billion and a half, are putting massive investment into renewables. And there will come a point where they'll turn that corner and, and, and they will be making progress. At which point will we still be sitting back and arguing amongst ourselves about, about the, 
the absolute, the, the greatest threat to the future. But, you know, for discussing with the, with, 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 with the volunteers this morning, it's all, also the other things that they can do. Pop-up cafes can take place in schools, in churches, in pubs. But generating that discussion around, around climate so that people are less sceptical and more willing to actually see that they can take action. I also looked at, there's, in Fife, there's, there's, there's Grow West Fife, and it's similar to some of the projects that have been described in the, in the briefing that we got, where, where they've talked about a climate garden and getting people to grow food. And the influence that that can have on local authorities, because that, 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 that like allotment movement that's there, local authorities, in my view, can do a lot more. Indeed, the Scottish Government, I believe, could do more. But a bottom-up approach by getting the resources into communities so that communities can lead. Uh, I'll conclude, but, but in, in doing so, this week I highlighted um, the sort of postcode lottery that there is around Scotland when it comes to electric chargers, and some places have more than others. But, but in highlighting that point, I was making the point we should involve communities in this. Communities, should, communities will know best where, for example, chargers should be, what can they charge us, how to operate them, how to, to run them, and for the benefit of the community. And it's this model that, that, that I think leads to that, because they talk about swap shops, they talk about where, where you can reduce food costs and, and support people. So, so in conclusion, can I say I'm very pleased at this debate here. I think that, that it needs to be bottom up. I congratulate everyone that's come along here today and everyone that's involved in these projects and all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. I now call Audrey Nicholl to be followed uh, by Mark Ruskell. Around four minutes, uh, Ms. Nicholl. Thank you very much. And may I also begin today by congratulating John Swinney on bringing forward this debate. Um, it recognises the role of his constituents in establishing the first climate cafe in Scotland, the role that climate cafes play in facilitating conversations and action on climate, and how their reach has grown. And having spent much of my childhood uh, living uh, in Perthshire in uh, Stanley with my grandparents, uh, I'm very delighted that um, Dunkeld uh, and Burnham, uh, their climate cafe, is leading the way. And as the motion puts it, climate cafes create a welcoming, inclusive, safe space within a community that is open to everyone to chat and act on climate. Now, I don't need to tell anyone that the North East is home to a shifting energy industry. Therefore, the narrative on climate can often be framed within an industrial context, opportunities in green jobs, green industrial development, new infrastructures supporting energy transition. And I don't need to tell anyone about the impacts of these changes uh, and how they will often most keenly be felt in communities and employment, businesses, and changes to the nature and structure of neighbourhoods. A just transition seeks to ensure all voices are included in the process of change. And just last week, the Minister for Energy updated the Parliament on the forthcoming energy strategy and just transition plan and stated, and I quote, the views of local communities are of the utmost importance. It is vital that everyone has the opportunity to engage in decisions about future development. And climate cafes are an important and accessible vehicle to make this happen. And I want to acknowledge the commitment of NESCAN and Aberdeen Climate Action in bringing people, people together uh, in the North East to talk climate and for supporting local action groups and projects in the North East. And um, with some help from Jess Pepper, who's been mentioned uh, already today, I had the pleasure of uh, joining uh, the Aberdeen Climate Cafe uh, earlier this week, where members heard from the Minister for Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity, Lorna Slater. They also heard from Skills Development Scotland and from Borders College, and they asked a very wide range of questions covering everything from hydrogen to skills passports to women in STEM careers and what is a circular economy. 
And I cannot talk community participation in the context of climate without acknowledging Professor Tavis Potts, Dean for Environmental Sustainability at Aberdeen University, for his work around the social dimensions of climate and energy and his commitment to deepening social participation in the transition in the North East through climate assemblies and participatory engagement. And of course, the reach of climate cafes goes much further than just local communities. And in this regard, I want to thank one of John Swinney's own constituents, uh, a member of the Blair Gowrie Climate Cafe, who kindly, very kindly sent me some beautiful photos uh, of St Fittix Park, uh, a green space in the heart of my constituency uh, and under uh, some threat from industrial development linked to the energy sector. And I think this lovely gesture really reflected the wider uh, investment Climate Cafe members have in our world beyond their own communities and neighbourhoods. So, presiding officer, given the choices we face about how we live and the legacy we want to leave our children and grandchildren, Climate Cafes will continue to play their part in those important community conversations, engagement and action. And I look forward to seeing them develop and expand across Scotland. And again, I wish to thank John Swinney for bringing this debate forward today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Nicholl. And I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Mark Ruskell, around four minutes, please. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Can I thank uh, John Swinney for bringing forward this members' debate? I gather, you know, his first members' debate in 17 years. I was trying to remember what that debate was 17 years ago. I may have even spoken in it, but I think what's clear is that John Swinney has been a very strong advocate for the communities in his constituency and for community action in his constituency over many years. So I'm delighted that he's chosen the topic of climate cafes for this members' debate because it is a Persia success story that has now spread around the world. And I notice many of the people who have been involved in the climate cafes in Scotland are, are here in the chamber with us today. Um, wonderful people I've met, I've met a number of them who are doing fantastic work in their communities. But I, I would also like to just pay tribute to Jess Pepper, who I think has been a simply astonishing um, climate leader over many, many years uh, in Scotland, following on from the work of her father and a, and a fantastic community activist in Dunkeld and Burnham as well. Um, I'd also like to just mention another individual, um, a young woman called Lu Ruby Flatley, who was a young activist who came through the Dunkeld and Burnham um, Climate Cafe. And at the age of 13, um, she led and spoke at the huge climate march that took place here in Edinburgh, just ahead of the Paris COP. And at the time, she was also running a series of uh, youth projects through the Dunkeld and Burnham Climate Cafe. And I'm, I'm really pleased to say that I understand she's still involved in that climate cafe movement um, today. Uh, I welcomed Ruby to the Parliament in 2016 when she was my nominated local hero at the, the opening of the Parliament. Um, so it, it's wonderful to see this movement nurture and empower young people. And it's clear to me that you know, communities need to be at the heart of climate action. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen climate action undermined and we've seen conspiracy theories being given uh, a platform at the highest level of UK politics. So that, that need for public discussion, for education, for awareness, for empowerment is so important. It's so important. And I don't think we can ever take for granted that there's some kind of implicit social license that comes with climate action. The conversation is going to change over the years. And I, I noticed that, you know, within Dunkeld and Burnham, for example, there's a very different conversation about the A9 dueling project that has changed over the years. So climate cafes are, are important. They're important for education. They're important as a laboratory of ideas for action as well. And I don't know if Mr. Swinney remembers, but he might recall the first agreement between the Scottish Greens uh, and the SNP back in 2007. It was quite a thin one. Um, but one thing that we did agree was that there needed to be the establishment of a climate challenge fund to effectively fund and to seed action in communities. Uh, and it was a very successful fund. It, it ran for, for over a decade. And now, of course, the government is investing in climate action hubs to take that action up to the next level, to pull together initiatives on the ground. And I noticed uh, Minister Lorna Slater was announcing a whole range of um, hubs that are last week in Stirling. But the point here is that the hubs can only build 
on what is actually already established on the ground. And it's the role of the climate cafes to really incubate those new ideas and to get the conversation going that can actually build that innovation. An excellent example of that that Mr. Swinney's already mentioned is the heat project in Blair, Blair Gary that emerged from a climate cafe conversation. It emerged from a recognition that those of us who live in rural properties, in rural Scotland, hard to heat properties, need that support, they need that bespoke advice. And that's exactly what the heat project um, has been doing. So I would say to the, to the cabinet secretary, perhaps in her in um, concluding remarks, um, you know, I, I'd urge the government to, to, to look at how we can make room within that community climate funding to support this kind of initiative. Because important as it is to scale up initiatives that are already there on the ground, you know, even mighty Persia oaks have to grow from acorns. And the important role of the climate cafes here is to seed those ideas around Scotland and around the world that can be built on, that can be scaled up and could really deliver the action that we need to tackle the climate emergency. I hope this government can find ways to support and to grow this movement and to inspire future generations of people like Ruby. Thank you very much, Mr Ruskell. I now invite Mary McCallan to respond to the debate, Cabinet Secretary, around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure uh, to do so. I think this discussion today has demonstrated that even in the face of something of the magnitude of the global climate emergency, our people uh, and our communities can have a substantial impact when they get the opportunity to come together and to act. Uh, I want to thank uh, John Swinney for, for bringing this debate centred on the people and the places and the issues that I know he's so passionate about. And after 17 years of doing one or two other things, uh, it's great to have this debate today. Um, and I know how thrilled he was to be able to bring it and to bring his constituents uh, to the Scottish Parliament. And it's them to whom uh, I am grateful uh, for all of the work that they have been doing to date. And I very much look forward to my own visit to Dunkeld and Burnham Ca Climate Cafe later this month. And I'll very much look forward to seeing uh, them all there. Because moving uh, towards becoming a net zero nation, it will require all aspects of Scottish society to embrace significant change. Imposing a, a one-size-fits-all approach will never create the desired outcomes, nor will it secure people's buy-in to the net zero transition. Instead, it is essential that as we change, we empower people to develop solutions that are appropriate, that are appropriate for them and their local circumstances. And that's why I so warmly welcome the commitment of those who are involved in climate cafes in providing that safe space for people from all backgrounds and across generations to come together, because we know that great things happen uh, when people get the opportunity uh, to do that. And climate cafes in Scotland are led by a network of dedicated volunteers. I'm so grateful for their hard work and for John Swinney's continued support of them, which I think has enabled the network to grow in all of the ways that we have heard about today. Uh, and for my part, I would like uh, Scottish Government to provide more practical support too, and I have asked my officials uh, to explore with the leaders of the climate cafes ways in which we can do this, uh, including through providing funding. And I'll discuss more of that with them when I visit them in the coming weeks. But last week, uh, during Scotland's Climate Week, I got the chance to spend time with the Fountain Bridge Canalside Community Trust. And I was also fortunate enough to visit the incredible children of St Bernard's Primary School in Glasgow, uh, one of the many schools supported by our Climate Action Schools programme, uh, which runs its own climate cafe in partnership with the local community. These groups, Dunkeld and Burnham Climate Cafe, alongside those that I'm really privileged to work with in my own constituency of with Climate Action Straven, the One Curlook Area Network, uh, What If, Bigger Climate Group, the passion of the individuals who give up their time and come together to work on these matters is a real inspiration for us all. Um, and in Scotland, I think this demonstrates that our communities are uniquely placed to play that really critical role in shaping and driving action. And that's why we're putting considerable support behind them. And uh, Mark Ruskell was absolutely right to mention the Climate Action Hubs. This programme is designed to enable that really essential collaborative approach to driving uh, behavioural change that we know needs to come 
and which isn't always easy. Uh, last week, he, you know, he mentioned that we are expanding the network. Well, a further four climate action hubs uh, were uh, commenced last week for Forth Valley, for Dumfries and Gallery, for Inverclyde and for Dundee. And that brings us to 10 hubs across the country with more proposals currently being assessed. We've committed to delivering a national network of climate hubs in this year's programme for government. Because, and I believe uh, very strongly and particularly reinforced by my experience of working with them, that these hubs designed by and for our communities will be one of the significant drivers of progress uh, in the climate front in the coming years. Now, beyond the, the hub programme, we're supporting action in a number of other ways. Our Climate Action Towns initiative, which is led by Architecture and Design Scotland, is supporting nine small towns uh, selected because they had historically been less engaged in climate action and are at particular risk from the impacts of a changing climate. Uh, the communities in these towns are being supported to develop local plans focused on climate action, which give them a voice and help ensure that the transition as they make it locally is most suited to their needs and their lived experiences. And this initiative, uh, now in its third year, has provided learnings that, that we in government, as well as local authorities, as Alec Rowley uh, rightly identified, and other public bodies, we can draw on this uh, in the way that we uh, create our uh, policy pathways. Um, we're also supporting partners to build capacity for collective action at local level. The Scottish Communities Climate Action Network, for example, has been supported to lead conversations uh, about climate change in their local areas. And in the last financial year alone, 54 new climate conversations facilitators have been trained and conversations held with 400 people across, uh, across Scotland. And this um, is backed up uh, in many ways by uh, the Scottish Government's engagement, uh, sorry, plans on, on public engagement for climate change. Our public engagement strategy clearly sets out three core aims uh, that we help, hope to enable the people of Scotland to do. Firstly, to understand how climate change relates to their lives. Secondly, importantly, to actively participate in shaping a fair, just and inclusive uh, approach. And lastly, to take action. And it's in line with these objectives that members of this chamber will be aware that the government recently launched the Climate Engagement Fund, which is a, a half a million pot to support trusted messengers to engage directly with their audiences on the climate emergency. And this fund has received a huge amount of interest, as I'm sure you can imagine, presiding officer, and uh, we will very shortly publish uh, details of how we plan to um, allocate that funding. Uh, but of course, the reason that, that we are here, the reason that the, the good uh, volunteers of, of our climate cafes do this work is because the recent UN stocktake report underlined the urgency of what they called systematic transformation of every aspect of our society and that if we are to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. And we must be committed to responding to that, uh, to that need and to ensuring that we support households and communities to embrace the, the quite rapid change that is now required. And on that point, and just in conclusion, I, I would echo the appeal uh, that John, Smith, John Swinney made that we continue very proactively and determinedly to find space for those realistic, urgent discussions and the requisite action uh, which will help us to combat climate change because there can be no greater task than helping to foster a safe uh, and secure and, and green future for generations to come. And the truth is government must do the heavy lifting in this regard, or uh, business must do the heavy lifting in this regard, but no one person is, small and, is too small to make a difference in and of themselves. But equally, we are far greater when we come together in our communities, in our cafes, and when we work together to make a difference. And I'll certainly continue to give all of my support in this role that I'm so fortunate to occupy uh, to our Climate Cafe uh, network in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate. I would encourage Mr Swinney not to wait a further 17 years before bringing his next one. And I suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30. <laughs>